Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Ketchum. I'm a bridge engineer, vice president of OPAC in San Francisco. My bridge engineering experience includes some uh, big projects all over the world. For example, design engineering on the Nanning Bridge in Nanning, China, construction engineering on the Hoover Dam Bypass, seismic evaluation and retrofit strategy for numerous suspension bridges, including the San Francisco West Bay Crossing. I'm here this morning to talk about the design of the third Carquinez Bridge, the suspension bridge that's uh, behind me uh, here at the site. Uh, the design of this bridge originated on my desk. I was a consultant to uh, Caltrans, the owner of the bridge, uh, all the way through design and construction. I was a bridge design manager uh, through type selection and uh, design development and uh, was responsible for extreme event design that's uh, seismic wind and ship collision during final design. This new bridge wouldn't have the design it has uh, without the, the, the background and the previous bridges at the site. The Carquina Strait at this location was first bridged in 1927 uh, by the first Carquina Strait Bridge, which has since been demolished. Uh, this was a uh, privately owned toll bridge uh, that was later turned over to the State Highway Department uh, after the profits had been made. Then in 1958, the second Carquina Strait Bridge was built. That's the truss bridge that uh, is behind the new suspension bridge. Uh, this was built as part of the conversion of this corridor from the original State Highway to Interstate 80. Uh, and it mimics the design of the 1927 bridge uh, in topology and form, except that it's a, uh, a 1958 modern welded structure instead of riveted and lacing barred structure like the original cantilever bridge. Then in, in the uh, 1980s, uh, the, the uh, owners of the bridge, now Caltrans, uh, came to the conclusion that the 1927 bridge was uh, deficient uh, uh, in both uh, geometry and, and, and strength uh, and that it needed to be replaced. After the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, Caltrans accelerated the, the replacement program because further investment in the 1927 bridge was uh, not considered um, sound. Caltrans's initial type selection process seems to have been driven by designing a structure with a pier configuration, a span arrangement configuration that matches the existing bridges. Uh, this is a, a good place to start because typically doubling the span would increase the cost and, and uh, shorter span bridges, all things being equal, would be more economical. In the end, we know that, that uh, a double span arch bridge, a cable stayed bridge with three towers uh, and a um, steel truss bridge with uh, a design similar to the 1958 bridge were all uh, looked at uh, and out of that mix the, the uh, cable stayed alternative uh, appears to have won with a beautiful physical model of the bridge at Caltrans headquarters in Sacramento. I saw that model uh, in the director's office, and I thought, wow, what a beautiful model, but not necessarily the right bridge. Uh, the, the, uh, the thought that crossed my mind is if this isn't a site for a suspension bridge, then there aren't any left. My colleagues and I at OPEC started sketching what a suspension bridge would look like for this site. And it looked more and more rational every sketch we made. We, we prepared a, a, a little, what I'll call, unsolicited uh, uh, structure type study, about 20 pages along with a, 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 a few sheets of drawings, uh, and, and concluded on the basis of, of uh, construction cost, uh, aesthetics, uh, construction risk, and structural performance that, that uh, the suspension bridge really shouldn't be overlooked as a viable option for this project. That was uh, presented to, to the uh, director of bridges at Caltrans and um, was it accepted? Well, here we are today. 
The concept behind the suspension bridge is that we can take the money we saved by not building that center tower, uh, which by the way is in swiftly flowing river water and presents a lot of risk and the costs associated with maritime construction. We could take that money we saved and spend it on the longer span. And in, in so doing, have a lot of the inherent advantages of, of a suspension bridge, uh, which are uh, lower cost, lower construction risk, better performance, and from the public perspective, uh, better appearance. So Caltrans reopened the pipe selection process and um, brought the suspension bridge into the mix and um, found that a lot of our predictions upon closer examination were seconded, were backed up. On that basis, the internal type selection process uh, concluded suspension bridge like we see today. So what do we have in this beautiful new bridge? We have the first major new suspension bridge in the United States in something like 35 years. We have the longest span suspension bridge in the United States since Verrazano Narrows, albeit a longer one has been built since Carquinas. And we have some very innovative structural engineering applied to what's really a classical American bridge form. Uh, this is the first suspension bridge in the United States with concrete towers. It's the first suspension bridge in the United States with shaft foundations. It's the first suspension bridge in the United States with a continuous jointless deck over the entire suspended length of the bridge. And it is the first suspension bridge in the United States with a, an orthotropic single cell deck designed in a wind tunnel to meet those uh, wind criteria of no flutter rather than being uh, stiffened with a truss. Uh, to answer the questions from strength instead of from finesse. So now, from the perspective of this session, what do we have aesthetically with the new Carquina Strait Bridge? Uh, I want to talk about that in terms of proportions overall, uh, in terms of the, uh, the towers, the deck, the anchorages, and the what I'll call user amenities, what's the, the, the pedestrian path, and, and the user experience crossing the bridge. Proportions are a big thing. Uh, the, 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 uh, I've, I've often said that it's, it's uh, hard to screw up a parabola and that's why people like suspension bridges so much, but, uh, but, but it's possible to do it. Uh, we have classical proportions here uh, with a, a, um, a, to support a, a main span of 728 meters. Uh, we have uh, a, a cable sag ratio of one in 10, uh, and, but also relative to that 720 meters, we have very short side spans. Uh, those are, are to meet the, the constraints uh, presented by, by uh, other um, infrastructure works. Uh, we have uh, a long existing railroad alignment on the south end of the bridge. Uh, we have a uh, uh, a bluff at the north end of the bridge that you can see in, in the background. There's a believed to be inactive, but never, nevertheless a, a fault at the top of that bluff. We had to span behind that fault. And we had to, to be able to have a, a short enough bridge that all of the interchange structures on the south side over the city of Crockett could match the geometry with, with modern high-speed curves. Visually, the dominant structural feature of this bridge is the towers. Uh, the, the towers are reinforced concrete. Structurally, I would say they're special moment resisting frames uh, with, with very ductile elements uh, to, to resist uh, seismic. Uh, but aesthetically, you'll see a few features that, that keep them from being just plain box towers. For one thing, the, the legs of the towers are battered. Uh, they're, they're leaned in a little bit uh, so that, I, first of all, uh, aesthetically, th that means that they don't look like they're getting wider at the top. Second, structurally, it means that the cable saddles at the top of the towers can be better oriented over the anchorages on the deck. Next, the, the components of the towers 
themselves. The tower shafts are, are, uh, are, are big boxes, uh, uh, hollow boxes, reinforced concrete, but with pilasters on the corners. The, the pilasters give some, some visual relief and I, I think are, are um, uh, really add to the, to the towers not looking as big as they really are, uh, and, but, are, but are there for structural reasons so that there are uh, hoop-tied boundary elements in the shear walls that make up the corners of, of the towers and instead of just being um, a plain box. My final point on the tower is that they're tapered, but only tapered from the perspective of river traffic, not from the perspective of highway traffic. This taper makes the bridge look better and it reduces the mass at the top of the towers. And believe me, from the seismic standpoint, we really need to reduce the mass of the towers. The deck of this bridge, more so than any other component, is purely engineered structure that also fits in with the with the aesthetics of, of the towers uh, and everything else I've talked about. Its purpose is to, is to uh, stiffen the bridge and provide against traffic loads and to provide aerodynamic resistance. It, its shape was, uh, uh, was drawn on the basis of experience and then refined in the wind tunnel so that uh, uh, no conceivable 10,000 year event would cause the destruction of the bridge due to flutter. Uh, and it was then detailed to, to uh, complement uh, the towers, uh, but uh, I, all of this strictly from a uh, structural and aerodynamic engineering perspective. Cable anchorages are there to keep these big steel wire cables from uh, pulling out of the ground and, and uh, are really the, the, the part of the lifeline of the structural engineering of the bridge. The north anchorage at the far end of the bridge uh, is buried in the ground uh, behind that local fault at the top of the bluff. And, and uh, uh, aesthetically, the, the cables disappear into the splay chamber. Uh, the south anchorage is a little bit different because we've got 130 odd foot clearance here and the cables drop down and, and the anchorage housing themselves are, are dimensioned to contain the splay chamber, but uh, we, we designed them so that you can imagine them as these conoidal structures that, that grip the cable. Nearly everything that I've talked about so far was designed by, by, structural, engineer with, by structural engineers with a, a really good sense of aesthetics and architecture. The place that the licensed architects had a role to play was in the, in the pedestrian path and in the user amenities associated with, with, with that path. So uh, we have a, a, um, a path that's big enough and wide enough to simultaneously accommodate peds and bicyclists, and we have handrails that had a, a big design constraint that they needed to be nearly transparent from a wind standpoint, but uh, were, were very artfully designed using components of the architectural vocabulary of the rest of the bridge to come up with a, a railing design that's in context and, and um, uh, adds to the user experience. Uh, what you're looking at in this bridge is pretty much pure structure without architectural embellishment in order to provide the, the aesthetic experience. Uh, my observations over the years is that's one of the most important ways to, to achieve um, uh, long-term acceptance and admiration of the aesthetics. Uh, to keep the bridge from being a fad bridge, the root of fad being for a day, and, and, and keep it rational and, and uh, uh, people will admire it for years. I think we've started off on a good foot that way. Uh, upon the opening of this bridge, John King, the, the architecture critic of the San Francisco Chronicle, described this new bridge as a ribbon of steel suspended from rectangles of air. 
and I think that's an appropriate description and one I'm proud to quote. Thank you.